Greetings, and bienvenue, Midna crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. I was going to post this story on slash K slash, but since that board has devolved into a meme factory, I figure you guys would enjoy this story more. I'm sharing this for the sake of entertainment and conversation. Before anyone asks, I do intend to return to the area of the incident later, to document and photograph whatever I find. So you can all go ahead and call me a schizo. I'll be back next Friday with another thread. I'ma try and remove as much as gun and marksmanship related subjects from the story, and stick to the parts that will interest you all. This was a slash K slash story after all. But given that I'm kind of an autistic Spurg, and given my military experience, I'm more familiar with writing a report than an actual narrative. So sorry for that in advance. This happened on Friday, Saturday night, February 24th, 2017. Some information about me. I'm 25 years old. I joined the army at 18 and did a tour in Iraq in 2014, before being honorably discharged due to heart arrhythmia in 2015. On the day of the incident, I had three other friends with me. Barney another friend from the military. We only met after I returned to civilian life. Barney is older and has been to combat engagements given he served in the Marines and is about 29, plenty of tours. Lambert, another mutual friend of ours who wanted to learn how to shoot guns, so we took him along. Joe, a friend and the son of the gun store owner we buy our guns from. Kevin, a nerdy friend who never shot anything in his life and could be knocked out by a strong wind. We headed out in the morning, about 7.15 a.m., to White River National Forest and drove for some miles before parking, then hiked some more, and proceeded to the setup camp in our designated spot. This wasn't a hunting trip as it's not hunting season. It's quite chilly now, but we had bought a lot of gear, and we just wanted to chill out, shoot stuff, and have some beer. Part 2. The White River National Forest Still, I had packed a Glock 20 and a Henry all-weather rifle in 4570 for fear of bears and mountain lions. I had also brought, for the fun shooting part, my Lee Enfield rifle I had been gifted by my dad. I also had a Remington shotgun stashed on my truck from a previous hunting trip. My friend Barney also had packed a Mossberg shotgun with some slugs. Joe had brought an AR-15 and Lambert just had a bow, and since he was going to learn how to shoot, we had armed him with a 12-shot, 38 special lever rifle I had never heard about that Joe had procured for the occasion. At this point I should also mention we also have women accompanying us. Since their role in this story is minimal, I won't introduce them. We set up camp around 11 a.m. Barney set up to prepare a fire and ready us lunch while Joe cleaned up the area. Me, Lambert and the girls went out to check out a stream and just hike a bit. We returned at 1300. 1 p.m., 8 bullshitted around then set out to hike again. This time we brought along our guns and the stuff we were going to shoot at. We found a suitable spot at around 15.15, 3.15 p.m. after much goofing around and started putting down rounds on cups and plates we had bought for the occasion until we got tired of it. It was about 17.45, 5.45 p.m. when we decided to return to camp for cozy drinking time by the fire. As we left... Barney lagged a bit behind as he was picking up some brass and shells from the ground. He was maybe about 100 feet behind us when I turned around to call him. I saw B standing there looking diagonally from the path we took. He looked stupidly confused and at the same time startled, so I turned back to see what was up. Part 3. Clever Girl At around 1900, 7 p.m., Joe caught sight of a large figure moving about the edge of the camp. We presumed it was the bear but given that we had fire, numbers, and guns, we stood easy. At around 1915, Barney had also caught sight of the animal circling the perimeter as light shined on it momentarily. Barney commented it was the weirdest black bear he ever saw. It had a very bear-like appearance, but it seemed hunched over too much, and there was something off to its appearance. At around 1918, I had seen it too. Like Joe said, it looked much like a bear, but there were a few off things. For one, this animal was huge. Black bears are big, but this one was almost the size of a grizzly. Also, it was somewhat more muscular, 
It hunched over a lot and drooped its head, but it also stood powerfully with its forelegs straight while its hind legs were crouched low. The fur seemed thick, and the animal had kind of a short mane, but it also thinned down a lot on its limbs and lower body. The facial profile was also kind of different. Bears have a familiar bearish face that makes you think they are cute and lovable. This animal looked mean, as if its sole existence was to kill and eat things. I actually mean it looked mean. Its snout was shorter yet thicker. Think of a Tibetan mastiff minus the adorableness. Its ears were round like a bear's, but a bit pointier, looking more like that of a raccoon. Around its neck, the black fur became reddish and the thing drooled everywhere. Movement-wise, it had that certainty of movement and grace like that of a large hunting dog, not that drooping, loose giant of a bear. We were getting pretty nervous at this time. We had fired a few warning shots to scare it away, but from time to time it would dart into sight back and forth at the very edge of our camp I could make out its shape perfectly against the night sky, and I kept trying to make up my mind on what the fuck kind of bear this was. So, tired of that bullshit, I picked up Henry and took aim. I had decided it was better to explain that I had bagged an aggressive animal out of precaution than getting charged in the night. The weird bear had popped into the edge of the light again, so I put my sights right below his shoulder area and pulled the trigger. The gun kicked up, and when I sighted again, I caught a look of the thing running first to the side, then out of sight back to the woods. We settled back down for a few minutes. The girls were pretty shaken up by now. Joe wanted to go track the beast down, but it was night and cold, and we were all a bit shaken up. No bear was going to come back after a 4570 hit, even if it somehow avoided having a hole explode on his chest upon being hit, the sound alone would scare any predator. Suddenly, Barney leapt up with my Enfield in hand and fired at one of our tents. The girls started screaming. I turned up to see right behind us about 30 feet away was another one of the things. Reflex kicked in and I opened up twice with the Henry. The thing turned and booked back to the woods in the blink of an eye while doing so and leaving a trail of blood and feces. Barney got up and kicked some more wood into the fire. We knew something was up then, because what had just happened was a pack hunting strategy. One animal drew our attention while its mate sneaked up from behind. We concluded these were either sick or starving predators given their appearance and that they were actively trying to hunt down our numerous and well-armed group. Me and Barney decided enough is enough and it was time to roll out. We would send Joe and Lambert ahead with a torch and with the girls, now that the animals had been scared away. Joe was a fantastic shooter and great hunter, so we knew he was up to the task. After they reached the truck, Joe would drive the girls and Lambert down to a park ranger station, then return with the guns and pick us up in the morning. Me and Barney would stick behind to pack our stuff and serve as distractions in case the things came back. Our truck was parked east and since the animals had come from both north and south, and one of them had fled southwest, we presumed that if they weren't dead, they'd approach from any direction from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Thus, if the animals returned to camp and found no one there, and decided to give chase, they'd catch the group relatively helpless, in the middle of the trail, in the dark. Hence, we decided to stick behind, make noise and throw more wood into the fire, to draw them in if necessary. We'd sit out in a tree until morning and leave with everything. I gave Joe the Henry, because he'd need the extra firepower if the animals ignored us and came from them. Barney handed his Mossberg to Lambert and gave Kevin a 357 snub he had for a carry-concealed weapon. This left me with my Glock 20 and the Enfield and Barney with Joe's AR. We let one of the girls keep the weird 38 lever action. As they left, me and Barney gathered up all the ammo and put a few essentials on our packs in case we had to leg it into the forest. I took our used clothing and the women's clothing and tossed it inside a tent, being careful to leave some out in the open. Barney kicked open our icebox and fished out a large pork rib we had brought for that night's barbecue, smeared it on the tents and hung above the fire to smoke, causing smell to rise up. Yes, we wanted to kill off the things by now, but hey... If they didn't show up, at least we'd have a meal. Part 4. Firefight with Mutant Bears Our plan backfired in the sense that we had set ourselves up in a large and tall pine tree up east. 
While it did render us invisible and provided comfortable and somewhat secure seats from large giant man-eating mutated werewolf bear things, it provided a terrible spot to shoot from, given that we were at risk of falling off at any time if we lost balance. Hence, Barney tied us up to the trunk. Basic plan. If bear things come back, wait for them to start messing with the camp, then mag dump how many times we can into them. If we bag at least one, the other will leave us alone and rangers will have an easier finding time if it's wounded. It was about 2100, and I had almost fallen asleep listening to some Joe Rogan rant on my phone when Barney elbowed me. I took out my earbuds and listened. Heavy footsteps and some low growls. The bear things were directly under us. I wondered if they had caught our scent and would come up the tree. But then Barney whispered that they had come east and from behind us the direction the group had set out in. It either meant they had caught the group, or that Joe had scared them away. We hadn't heard gunshots, though. Or that the smart bastards were changing their strategy. They moved up to the camp and we decided to wait for clear shots. I'll reiterate now everything I've said about their appearance. Two of them looked exactly the same, one smaller than the other. Male and female. As soon as they reached what I assumed to be the perfect range, and had moved close together enough so they had lined up perfectly for Barney's AR, I fired the first shot, Barney mag-dumping on semi-auto in sequence. One of the things got hit in the back and booked it to the woods due west. The other turned to stare for a moment, so I shone my light in its face and Barney gave it the one-two tap. It got hit in the belly area, and the thing roared before booking south. I scanned the area with my light for the next hour, while Barney decided to try to phone Joe. After some attempts, Barney got through to Joe, who had left the group with a large party of campers they had found along the way. After telling them to get the park rangers, and was returning with Lambert to pick us up, he'd try to reach the camp with the truck this time so he wouldn't have to risk another walk in the dark. As soon as Barney put down the phone, I felt something flying amazingly fast past my head and bonk the pine trunk with force. It was a fucking rock the size of my fist and it had come up somewhere down to my left. I had barely completed that sentence when a goddamn stick hit me in the forehead. I blind fired at random and tried to duck to hug the tree limb I was sitting on, but being tied to Barney that was impossible. Meanwhile, Barney was also getting peppered with pines, sticks and stones. The shitty things were throwing rocks at us. The fucking bears were actually throwing shit at us. We yelled at each other what the hell several times while firing at random and getting bombarded with rocks deciding what was happening was simply impossible until they threw our goddamn icebox at us. Barney yanked out his knife and cut the belt that tied us together. We both hugged that tree limbs for cover and yet still the beast bombarded us. A stone hit me in the small of my back and I lost all my air. Barney got hit in the head and yelled fuck it and jumped down from the tree. I sat up and shined my light around intending to give Barney some line of sight in case one of the things charged him on the ground. As soon as I heard him yell my name, I made my way down until I could jump down safely. Barney had just tossed himself off a three-story tall tree, basically. We hit the ground and legged it down the trail. I took point with the end field, and Barney watched behind as his gun was more suitable for mag dumping while we ran away. About 20 minutes later, I heard something crash through the branches to my right, north, so I turned and shined my light on one of the things running parallel to us. I yelled left and shot the thing in the side. It fell down with a thud and rolled out of sight as I turned right to see Barney sighting down the big one, who was coming at us from that direction. I pointed and fired. Barney opened up with the AR, about four rounds before it jammed up. I pulled up the Glock and just fired blindly thinking the thing was upon me. I fired about three shots and felt my butthole unclench given the relief that the thing was nowhere to be seen. Me and Barney took off in a dead sprint in the direction we thought the trail was. We fell about ten times and kept pushing through. Then all of a sudden we started to hear a loud noise gaining on us and felt something coming at us from behind. Tired and out of air we just turned to blind fire. Then there we see the truck approaching us from the trail. We booked it back, and while I jumped in the back seat, Barney simply dove, jumped, and tossed himself like a sack into the back of the truck. Joe speed off as me and Lambert dragged dead-tired Barney in through the rear window. As we pull out his last leg, I look at the edge of the woods, and I see the big one prancing there. 
heavy breath causing a thick fog to come out of its nose, fur covered in blood from where we hit him. It bared its teeth at us and disappeared, maybe finally scared of the goddamn truck. Part 5. Debriefing We drove far enough that we encountered the campers Joe had left the party with. They had been trying to raise the rangers by phone, after taking a look at me and Barney, wounded and all torn up from the rocks and falling down every two seconds. They decided to take our word for it and leave the goddamn area because of rock-throwing mutant bears. We all headed down to the first ranger station at one of the entrances. First ranger we talked to, old grizzled dude, writes down everything and puts a call on the radio. He thinks we've encountered bears infected with rabies. No explanation for the throwing of rocks. No explanation why nobody could hear the third battle of Fallujah taking place a few miles over. Chief Ranger, or whatever his title was, comes in and asks us to stay the night. Joe calls his dad and he shows up to pick up everyone that isn't staying, so we can have the truck to head back to the campsite. We keep the guns on us, of course, and the Rangers seem to understand even though they don't quite believe the story. Anyway, we had a good night by the fireplace, drinking whiskey and sipping chicken broth and hearing old Ranger stories from the old Ranger dude. I even fell asleep on the couch by the fire, Best night of my life even though I was nearly murdered by a rock-throwing bear werewolf. The next morning we are accompanied by three additional rangers. Nobody is buying our story, even the Barney has a stone-shaped red imprint on his forehead, and they are sticking to the bear with rabies theory. However, I did notice they were very well armed for people who thought they were going after a black bear. One ranger had a Marlin rifle chambered in 308. Another had a Red Hawk Alaskan on a chest holster, 454 Casul, and the final one carried a 44 Henry. Our campground was completely demolished. Tents had been torn and thrown around, food was gone, including the beer, the pork ribs stolen, duh, and clothing littered everywhere. Lucky none of the clothing had been damaged too much, and the rangers helped us gather stuff like wallets and phones that had been left behind. On the way over we did find bear tracks, or at least bear-like tracks, dried up blood and fur, and a bunch of our casings. I also showed the ranger the tree we had hid in, and how the ground around it was littered with rocks and sticks, and how our icebox was stuck on a branch halfway up. They concluded it was bears, possibly two grizzlies. They were black, goddammit, with rabies. Then they ordered us to pick up our casings on the trail back. Part 6 Conclusion I'm going back next Friday at least for pictures and documentation purposes. I don't want to spend the night, although Barney is coming and is willing to camp out there if we find more guys and bring more guns. I will at least try to set up trip cameras I borrowed from my dad if it isn't snowing too badly. I'm positive those things were not bears, and I can't explain how they didn't die or got scared after getting shot so many times by relatively large caliber bullets. I'm not sure if it was only two, or if we actually killed one or two, and were set upon by others. Or maybe I'm just a terrible shot under pressure and missed everything. Thoughts and opinions. This was not something I witnessed, but instead one my grandmother told me about that my aunt later corroborated independently, so I think they're trustworthy. At the time, I'll note there wasn't much talk of dogmen, as this was about a decade before the infamous song came out though there was talk of wolves or werewolf-like monsters in Appalachia for a long time, so my aunt and grandmother just always called it that wolf thing. For a little background, my grandparents, currently aunt's home, is in backwoods of western Grayson County, Virginia, which to this day is still sparsely populated outside of one or two large towns on the east side, and back then it was even less so. Extremely thick forest with hilly terrain in all directions. You have to get on a dirt path and follow it for about half a mile to get to a gravel-covered side road, and then follow it for about 30 minutes to reach a very small town just across the North Carolina border. If you go a short ways north, you find yourself at the Blue Ridge Mountains and Parkway that lead up into Appalachia proper. The forest is mostly low-lying shrubs up to around four feet high with pine and a lot of black oak trees making up the canopy. There is a very clear stream about 30 yards from the house which has fish quite frequently. This along with wild blackberries, tender leaf shrubs, and some apple trees make it very lucrative for wildlife. The house itself is an old two-story house built onto an incline of the hill that overlooks it. 
This was back in the 1970s. My aunt believes it was 1978, as she was finishing high school at the time. My father had graduated from college and was going on to the Air Force, so he had already moved out. My grandfather, although he was old enough to retire, liked to remain busy so he worked his old job as an electrician and power pole technician, just now in an advisory role because he was getting up there in years. He had just gotten the contract down in North Carolina so he was away from the house for about a week and a half. This left only my 17-year-old aunt and grandmother at the house. As I said, there usually was a lot of wildlife in the area. A typical morning for my grandmother was making breakfast and sitting out on her porch watching deer and rabbits eat at the shrubs. Sometimes she would also see or hear a bobcat, fox, or coyote about. On one occasion, a mountain lion and her cubs strolled right past the house. One animal she was familiar with in particular was a very large black bear who could be recognized by folks around those parts from a white patch on his chest and a hole in his left ear. My grandmother nicknamed him Captain because he had a habit of sitting on his haunches and reaching up with his paws to pick apples, a motion that looked like he was saluting. Captain was a very big black bear but wasn't very aggressive unless tested. He seemed to have an agreement with my grandmother and grandfather that if they left him alone he would leave them alone. He'd just strolled by the house every now and then to have some blackberries on the bushes or apples that had fallen down which meant he came by the house's yards often as he was too big to climb trees much more, and the fruit trees around the house were low enough he could reach up and pick food. My grandfather guesstimated he was somewhere in the 500 to 600 pound range and roughly six feet tall as my grandfather once measured some scratch marks he left on a tree. During the week, my grandmother noticed a fairly sharp decline in the animals nearby. It was the latter part of summer in a wet season, so most of the plants were in full bloom and the leaves were at their tenderest, yet she couldn't see the hide nor hair of any rabbits or deer coming to graze. A coyote she had been yapping every night for the past month seemed to vanish. A few neighbors, by neighbors I mean people who lived within five miles, who stopped by told her something had taken their dog and their chicken coop had been smashed into. They assumed the mountain lion that lurked about had done it since it was the only other thing that could feasibly take down a large farm dog as they had seen Captain the only other predator nearby big enough to take down a 80-pound-plus farm dog, the day after in a completely different area gorging himself on a dead deer. They checked around and couldn't find anything. The next night, my grandmother was woken up by my aunt who told her that she heard something bang against the outside of her wall. They checked around in the morning after and found one of the deer butchered with a bloody smear on the wall. Judging from the way the gravel was disturbed, the deer had been walking by the house when something ambushed it, and in the struggle, it got smacked against the wall. My grandmother, having grown up in the woods, was familiar with predator kills and methods. Mountain lions tend to jump on the back and rake their claws across the flanks to hold on as they bite the neck. Black bears will usually break the neck or the back with their paws while biting the head, and the rare occasions coyotes attack deer. They usually do it by biting down on the inside of the leg, and twisting to rip the muscle and arteries. This kill clearly had the throat ripped out, but there weren't any claw marks to be found, and the bite looked narrower than what a cougar would do. Plus, she could gander there was only one predator from the way the ground had been disturbed, which didn't make sense for coyotes as they typically hunted in pairs, since just one alone isn't usually enough to bring down a full-grown deer. After disposing of the carcass, the next few nights were relatively uneventful except for the fact that several times my aunt or grandmother would be woken up in the middle of the night by the sound of something panting outside. Now in these woods you can hear a pin drop if it's close enough, and at some points they could swear the animal making the painting was directly outside the wall. One day my grandmother was picking some berries when she noticed what looked like dog tracks of a very large hound going through a mud flat bordering the nearby stream. Thinking it might be the missing farm dog who had maybe just run away, she followed the tracks until she heard something loudly growling at her from across the stream. She looked up to see the partially obscured face of what looked like a large, bulky, brown-colored coyote or wolf standing in a thicket on the other side of the stream. She quickly began to back away, glancing back only to check her footing on the slope that led down to the stream. When she looked back, she saw the very distinctly canine face in much greater detail because the animal had moved out from under cover. 
but instead of stepping out of the leaves like she thought it did at first, she soon noticed that it was instead standing up on its hind legs and peering over the shrubs. Now she had seen canines standing upright before. Dogs do it. Foxes can do it. Coyotes sometimes do it. It was the size that took her off guard. She had been to that exact same thicket of shrubs just the other day, and her head only just barely reached the top, and my grandmother was around five foot three. This thing had its head pitched clear over the shrubs with a little bit of extra visible, and usually when a predator is making no attempt to hide, it's usually because it's trying to intimidate someone. My grandmother managed to back away to the hill without turning around, and when she started to get out of sight, the creature stepped out of the thicket on its hind legs. It strolled forward in a very uncanny way she had trouble describing, but she insisted it never went back down on all fours. Needless to say, she ran to the house in a backpedal sprint. That night they heard the panting again along with a distant howl and scraping sounds. They found the garage door, back door frame, and kitchen window frame all had claw marks on them from something investigating them. The canine creature was seen a few more times across the week by my grandmother and the neighbors, usually on or near the area of my family's property. My aunt finally saw it when she saw a pair of fuzzy ears outside her window. Now she wasn't startled right off the bat from this as Captain had come by her window a few times before, and she gradually lost some fear of the big bear over the years. But in his case, his ears just barely reached the edge of the window seal, whereas in this case, you could clearly see them and the top of their owner's head. She quickly realized it wasn't the bear because of the pointed shape, brown coloring, and the fact it had two fully intact ears. They also started to detect a very pungent smell on a side door porch, one time finding what looked like some urinal or some other liquid stains on it, suggesting an animal had sent marked it to claim the spot. It all came to a head on a Wednesday night when they heard howling in the distance grow closer. My grandmother flipped on a porch light and glimpsed the canine animal quickly sprinting across the lawn on its hind legs again, her sighting confirming how big it was. She'd seen timber wolves at the zoo up to 150 pounds, and she was certain this was at least a bit more than twice that size. For several hours of the night, they could hear it roaming around the property and pressing against doors like it was trying to find a way in. They glimpsed at several points the shine of yellow eyes peering in through the windows, as well as broad, long-fingered paws being pushed against the glass briefly. This was the day and age before cell phones and 24-hour police service in some rural areas, so no one had a means of immediately calling the police. Instead, my grandmother had to wait arduous minutes on a dial line with difficulty trying to call the police station two towns over. She was distracted by my aunt screaming, running into the bedroom to get one of the guns out. She had been sitting in the living room when she felt clicking against the glass and saw that wolf thing pressing its face and bared teeth against the surface with its claws fully outstretched. Both of them started to try to get the rifles or shotguns out. It was becoming increasingly clear the creature was trying to get into the house and knew they were in there. They heard it panting through a wall before there was the sound of heavy footsteps and a very loud thump with a flash of fur on the edge of the window. They ran to the innermost room, the pantry locker, and stayed in there with the guns. Now it's not like in the movies when creatures roar, snarl, and hiss constantly no matter what they're doing. But they did hear a commotion outside. My aunt and grandmother hadn't the faintest idea what was going on and didn't investigate until the morning after, but they could tell something was antagonizing something, as occasional grunts, barks, and rumbles were audible through the blackness for about a minute and gradually moved off. They found no bodies, but there had clearly been a ferocious altercation. The ground was ripped up in multiple spots, the wall had a dent in it, and there were some oxidized blood traces on the grass and dirt. My grandmother also found a trail where something had charged through the shrubs and recovered several vague dog prints as well as wider tracks moving the same direction. The animals all seemed to come back by the end of the week and the howls stopped. When my grandfather came back home, he, my aunt, and some neighbors surveyed the area to make sure they couldn't find the wolf creature. Evidently, the neighbors had also heard howls around their property at night that stopped recently too. They couldn't find it despite surveying the whole property, though they did find what looked like a track leading out of the property and running off into the mountains. 
Several days later, my grandmother saw Captain again, marking his territory by rubbing up against a tree in their yard and scratching the bark. He had several cuts across his muzzle, was missing patches of fur, had some healed bite wounds on his arm, and the hole in his ear had been torn open to the point he was missing half the ear flap. But other than that and a slight limp that went away with time, he was fine. My aunt joked that he looked rather proud of himself. When he was told about the urine-like smell on the doorstep when the wolf creature was running amok, my grandfather speculated it was trying to claim the territory. Usually black bears are relatively docile, but evidently Captain took issue with this newcomer imposing on his space and became aggressive. So what my grandmother and aunt heard was that one night the bear was charging while it was distracted and engaging the intruder. While the wolf-looking creature was taller, it seemed skinnier and less massive, and apparently in a confrontation and threat displays that likely followed, sheer bulk won out. Apparently it decided it wasn't worth claiming this spot if it meant having to square off with a quarter ton of claws and teeth for it. Captain had run the intruder off to protect his territory and coincidentally help my family. As a thank you, and so he could recover his strength quicker, my grandmother trimmed the apple trees to down all the fruit and let the bear enjoy himself without feeding him directly. Don't want to associate humans with food. Winter would be in a few months and she wanted him fattened up so he could stick around for the next year, just in case. As she put it, the forest will always have a boss, and it's better to have one who's not interested in eating you. Decades have gone by, and while both my grandparents and Captain have passed, the dogman creature never returned. There's been about three black bears who've moved into Captain's place since, and each has grown about as big as he was. Thankfully, that seems to have been enough to ward off any large canines. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time. Remember to check the Odyssey and Rumble pages for separate archives of previous broadcasts.